Palm Sunday, um, and that is exciting. This is a big, big event in the church calendar. Yes, Easter is next Sunday. That's even bigger. But, but today we remember the triumphal entry of our king, um, and that's not little. So I don't want that to be little today. So let's pray, and then we'll jump into it. Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for seeing us. Um, God, I, I know there's a temptation to, to hide from you and fear that if you really know us, you would reject us. So thank you for seeing us, knowing us fully, and loving us completely. And God, I ask that this morning, for everyone in this room, that you would just illuminate your word. And that your, your word, and as we look at this account of you coming to become king, to come to the cross, to die in our place and to, and to, to rise again, that you, you would make that big and real to us today. That you would reach us. And Holy Spirit, that you would move. And God, that this wouldn't be about anything that, that I have, but about what you have this morning. So would you take over and lead us? We love you. We're hopeful and excited for you to reach us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so, so I have this situation um, that happens in my life way too often. Uh, it's actually quite frustrating, but I find myself doing this all the time where I need to get somewhere. I need to get into my truck or get into my house or get into the office. And for some reason, I'm always carrying way too much stuff. Sometimes cereal, sometimes sports stuff, sometimes random power cords, water bottles. And, and I'm often walking to the office door, to my truck door, to my house like this, just carrying too much stuff. And I'll get to the door, and I'll think, it's okay because of the way I've organized uh, how I'm holding stuff. I can just get my keys out of my pocket, and then I go and I reach to get my keys out of the pocket, and they're always, always, every single time in the wrong pocket. They're never in this pocket. They're always in the pocket where all my stuff is. And so what I have to do every single time is put all the stuff down, not that far down usually, but um, all the stuff down and get my keys out of the pocket on the side that everything's on, open the door, and go in and pick up the stuff and be on my way. It's super annoying. It happens like, it, okay, I wrote this on Friday. This happened to me this morning without even thinking about it. That's how irritating uh, and obnoxious it is. Um, but as, as I was thinking about this thing that happens all the time, I thought maybe this happens in more ways than just the physical annoyance. Perhaps this happens to me, and maybe for you, it's a picture of us spiritually. That if our, our, our keys were the gospel or the role that Christ has in our life, are we holding on to so much stuff that we've lost sight of the gospel and how much we need it to get through life? So much stuff. Holding on to so much what, though? I don't know what it is for you. It could be that you're just doing too much. You're too busy, or you're just too, too busy thinking about the next thing that you have to get to that you're not thinking about the gospel, thinking about Christ. It could be things we're making a bigger deal than Jesus, just priorities, priorities we have in, in our heart and in our mind that are a bigger deal. It could be baggage from some things you've done in the past that you just can't put down and let the gospel be applied to that and move forward. It could be baggage from things done to you in your past. But whatever it is, you know that it feels like a lot. And it can feel like you just can't get your keys out of your pocket to get them to get through the door. And maybe, maybe for you, your keys aren't even in your pocket. Full disclosure, that, that was me this morning. I needed to get in the office. I came through here first, picked up some stuff from youth group, my coffee, some handbooks, and I go to the office door, and I'm like, oh, shoot. Oh, was, nope, not this one. So I move all the stuff over. Not this one. My keys are in my truck. So the keys were way further from me than I even realized, and I thought, man, maybe that's even true for us. Like, we have just left the gospel in the truck and trying to go about life, holding on to so much stuff. Whether it's our busyness, whether it's our past, whether it's our shame, we're just holding on to it, thinking we can get through life, and all of a sudden we're like, I can't, I can't do it anymore. I need the gospel. And so what does it look like 
to set that stuff down. And my hope is that as we go through this week, Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Easter or Res- Resurrection Sunday next week, that you see Jesus Christ for who he actually is. And that he reveals himself to you maybe in a way that, that keeps your keys from being lost or hidden in the day-to-day things of life, where the gospel is in your hand and the impact of Christ and your relationship with him is in your hand as you try to go through things, not somewhere hidden while you hold on to all the other stuff. And so this morning we're going to look at this triumphal entry of our king, and we're going to look in the book of John. So if you have a Bible, would you please get it out? We'll be in the book of John together. We'll be in John chapter 12. I know we've been going through Luke, um, but I wanted to be in the book of John today for for this account. It's Palm Sunday, so we can kind of get out a series for a couple weeks, and, and, and the Gospel of John is just one of my favorite books in the Bible. I always tell people if they're new to the faith or maybe even not a believer yet, um, I would recommend them read the book of John. Um, and it's just a beautiful account of the life of Christ through his best friend on earth. John is different from the other gospels. We have the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they're telling many of the same stories from really same perspectives. And John covers some of that same stuff, but 90% of what's in the book of John is, is unique to the book of John. John doesn't focus on many of the miracles and parables and, <clears throat> and the other things of, of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He focuses on different things. And rather focusing on all the things that Jesus did, John focuses a lot on who Jesus was and why we need him. He actually sums this up quite well at the, towards the end of the book in John chapter 20, verse 31. He says that these things are written, the things I've written in this book are so that you may believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that you may believe and have life in his name. So John, in, a, in like an evangelistic way, wants it to be incredibly clear who is Jesus He wants you to know for sure what he has done for you. And he desperately wants you to know and believe that Jesus is Lord and that you should follow him for the rest of your life. Also, I think it's important to know that John was one of Jesus' best friends. They had a deeper relationship, friendship, probably than the rest of the 12. And John was the only one who was at the foot of the cross as his best friend was being unjustly put to death. He was the only one of the disciples that was there. So you can see where his passion comes from. This was not just some historical research paper to update us on some guy's life. This was his best friend who was the son of God and was killed as though he was a murderer. And the story we're going to look at today is not small. It is, in fact, in all of the Gospels. It's a really big deal. So if you're not at John chapter 12 yet, please turn there. And we'll start in verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped, and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii? And given to the poor. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used he used to him he used to help himself with what was put in it. Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. 
For the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me with you. If you're not familiar with it, in the previous chapter, Jesus' good friend Lazarus had died. And Jesus shows up, and, and John includes this very personal, emotional response of Christ weeping at the death of his friend of him showing Jesus Christ, the Son of God, being sad about really sad things. Even though he knew shortly after he would raise him from the dead, he was still sad. He was in the moment, and John, his friend, remembers that was a big deal. It's the shortest book in, or verse in the Bible. Jesus wept at the death of his friend. But he wasn't weeping because this was final. He knew what he was about to do, but it was sad. His best friend had just died. Not his best friend, one of his good friends had just died. But he didn't stay dead. Jesus raises him from the dead. And the news of this unheard, unheard of miracle would travel quickly. The crowds around would start believing more and more and more. And the crowds believing in Jesus would just grow in a compounding rate because they've heard of this miracle. Now in this scene, we have Mary, Martha, the disciples, and Lazarus reclining at the table eating with Jesus. They're really having kind of like a dinner party to celebrate their friend Lazarus is alive. That's a big deal. And I just want to note here, like where was Lazarus just a couple days ago? Dead. Lying dead just a couple days ago, and now he's reclining with Jesus, feasting with Jesus. And I just want you to see how much you have in common with Lazarus, how much we have in common with Lazarus. We were once, once spiritually dead, and now because of Jesus, we've been made alive and in communi communion with Christ. It's also a picture of, of all of, of our futures. If you're a believer, this is a picture of your future. We will all die. We are all going to die. But if you believe in Christ, it is promised that you will be feasting in his presence forever and ever. And that's what Lazarus is, is doing right here. And as they're reclining and having this dinner, Mary pulls out a pound of this very expensive ointment. And John is foreshadowing here. Pretty hardcore, actually. Uh, the, the ointment, not just the picture of, of Lazarus, but now the ointment, the ointment Mary is using is an ointment that's normally used just for a burial spice. When, when, when loved ones would die, they would put this ointment on their loved ones as they buried them to pre preserve them in a way. And so with this very precious and valuable gift, Mary is preparing Jesus' body but she's also preparing us, the reader, for what would come. What is going to come? And it says she took a Roman pound of this oil, which would have been equivalent to like the size of a soda can. If you're like wondering, well, how much is a Roman pound? I don't know. Uh, it was about the size of a soda can, and it would have been worth 300 denarii. How much is that? I, we just got back from, from Guatemala a couple weeks ago. Like the, the conversion rates of money is very confusing, but uh, one denarii equaled a day's wage for the average worker. How much was this one worth? 300. So the cost of this gift that Mary was giving to Jesus was worth about one year's of a man's salary. It was a great cost, a great sacrifice. And as one author once put it, this was her way of yelling from the mountaintops, Jesus is worth it. He is worth this. You could say she knew where her keys were at. Mary knew where her keys were at, and she doesn't just give him this gift. She humbly uses her hair to wipe his feet with it. She brings out her very best, and she sacrifices her hair, her body, to honor and adorn her Savior. And John gives us a just striking contrast in Judas. Judas is beside himself, He's like, how could Mary have been so wasteful? What was she thinking? 
where's our essential oil ladies at? We got any of those in the room? Like Judas was all about making money off of these oils. Yeah, Judas would have been at the top of your pyramid scheme for sure, like if you're into that kind of thing. But, but all jokes aside, we have this, this stark contrast of, of Mary with this genuine love, this authentic love for Jesus, screaming like he is worth it. And Judas is deceptive and hypocritical. Matt Carter says that Judas serves as a warning. He looked and spoke the part of a disciple. He could have supported his suggestion to give the money to the poor with hundreds of Old Testament verses. However, his motive was self-centered. He was only concerned about what he could get from Jesus. Judas looked good on the outside. At a glance, he seems moral even. He just cares about the, the poor people. He just wants to help them out. But money and possessions are more important to him than Jesus was. I would say his arms were full of stuff and he had no clue where his keys were at. John tells us that he didn't care about the poor, but he was a thief. And Jesus rebuked Judas and told him to leave Mary alone. Jesus said, look, she's going to need these things for an upcoming burial. John does not keep the upcoming grave concealed. Then in verses 9 through 11, when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Huh. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So we see the adversaries of Jesus are really panicking. Why? They're losing people. This is a problem. The legalistic Jewish leaders are so concerned with all of these people, Jewish people, for the most part, actually believing that this must be the Messiah that they had to intervene. This evidence that he is the Son of God is now literally walking around them in the form of Lazarus. He was dead. Many people knew he was dead. Like, look, this isn't just some guy that came out of the woods. Oh, I heard there was a dead guy that Jesus saved. Like, this was a guy they knew. Like, think of, like, your community. Like, so-and-so died. We know he died, and all of a sudden, he's at Walmart. Oh, my goodness, he's alive. What happened? Jesus saved him. And so I think, what a picture for us today to consider. Like, do our lives and the lives of those around us, do they point to a God that changed us from being dead to alive? Does the way you live point to what's actually happened to you spiritually? Like you were, you were once dead and you have been made alive in Christ. Could the world or those observing see, oh my goodness, that guy who was like that is now like that? What was the difference? Oh, Jesus was. Wow. I gotta know more about Jesus. If he can do that kind of thing. If he can change someone like that. But Lazarus was walking around now alive after he had just been dead. And many people know he's alive, and they know the only reason he's alive is because of Jesus. And that is hard to compete with. To be honest, that's hard to compete with today. If we really considered that and took that seriously. And the particular party that had an issue here in verse 10 were the Sadducees. The Sadducees would have been a much smaller group in number compared to the Pharisees. Um, they were wealthier. They certainly had more power. They controlled the temple politics and services. They were known for being arrogant, power hungry, and rude. However, they, they actually rejected a lot of the Old Testament. Um, they believed in the Pentateuch, so the first five books of the Bible, they believed in those. But after Deuteronomy, they, they felt like God was pretty inactive with his people. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in demons. They didn't believe in an afterlife. And they certainly didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They were more like modern day deists with a lot of money and power. But having this ideology of no resurrection from the dead created even a bigger problem with this whole Lazarus situation, didn't it? Not only was his resurrection causing the followers of Jesus to multiply greatly in number, it contradicted their ideology that said this isn't possible. 
And so this is bizarre. I know this would never happen today, but as the actual proof and reality of that their ideology is false is walking in front of them, they don't say, huh, we might be wrong about some things. They say, we gotta kill them so that no one believes this is possible. Like their response to seeing living, breathing proof that their ideology could not be true is to kill the only evidence that says it is not true. It's pretty crazy, actually. But obviously, after, after this had happened and after Lazarus is walking around, the support on one hand for Jesus is growing like crazy. And the opposition for, for Jesus and the zeal behind it is also growing. They're both growing at a compounding rate. These two aren't gonna, they're not gonna go together very well. Which brings us to verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. This is a big deal. Like this, isn't, this isn't a little part of the story. I want you to remember that these people since the garden had been waiting for a Messiah with great anticipation. The one who would crush the serpent's head, the one who would set the captives free, the one that would reign forever and ever on high. He's been talked about and discussed. And this, this story and the promises of God for him to come and one day rule over them had been shared orally from generation to generation grandparents telling their grandchildren the stories of old about Egypt, Babylon, slavery, exile, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and one day a king to rule forever and ever. And on this day, this one day, that king was actually here. It's not little. Thousands of years, slavery, captivity, exile, one day, one day he's coming, one day he's coming. That day is here. He is arriving. Hosanna, Hosanna. And they had, many had seen this coming. They actually wanted to make Jesus king earlier. Back in um, a few chapters back, when Jesus fed the 5,000, people tried to take him by force and make him king. And he said, my time has not yet come. But the time has come. And the Messiah had come to be their victorious king. However, he had not come in the way that they had expected. They had misunderstood some of the promises in the Old Testament. In their bondage to Rome, they desired a political savior to restore Israel to power. And look, I get it. Rome was rough. They, they, were, they were really treating the Jews terribly. The Jews had been tired of being treated terribly. They wanted a political savior to come in and destroy their enemy. However, Christ had come not to save them from the tyranny of Rome, but to save them from the tyranny of sin. These crowds didn't know that, but they celebrated all the more. And it was right for them to quote Psalm 118, which is a psalm of victory and celebration all the way through. But they, they quote that as he comes and the crowd, what they're saying is accurate. It is biblically accurate. In verse 13, it says they took palm branches and they went out to meet him and they cried out, reciting verses 25 and 26 of Psalm 18, which said, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And the palm branches that they were waving and laying down at the feet of Jesus for a long time had been a symbol of Jewish nationalism and pride. And here they are, laying them at the feet of this new king, as they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, which translates to, save us now, save us now. Blessed King of Israel, who has come in the name of the Lord. And the crowd, they didn't know who Jesus was. They, they had missed some things, but Jesus knew. He knew who he was, and, and, and he knew who they were. And he was grieved that Israel, his people Israel had missed him. In the introduction to the book of John in chapter 1, John says that Christ came to his own, but his own did not receive him. In Luke, it is recorded that Christ, as he approached the city, he said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as hens gather her brood under her wings, but you are not willing. 
sadness. He felt that over Jerusalem. But on this day, the the crowd was receiving him, and they were excited because the long-awaited king had arrived. Finally. Who was this crowd? I think there has been some error made uh, over the years. It's certainly an error that I have made myself. I know I have. Um, It is often, um, I have often said that how crazy is it that the same people shouting Hosanna, Hosanna when he arrived on Palm Sunday would just at the end of the week be shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Um, but I don't, I don't think it was actually the same people. There's not really much evidence that it was the same people. And we, we read all four accounts of this story. We can see that the people laying their palm branches and, and shouting Hosanna were mostly Galileans and others that had made this long journey to Jerusalem. They would have had more proximity to him and seen his miracles and all the works he had been doing and heard about this and they followed him to Jerusalem on their way to Jerusalem for Passover. We see this in, first, in verse 17 that we just read. John said that the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, they continued to be with him and bear witness. So it was the crowd that had been with him mixed with prob- probably some of the general populace of Jerusalem um, that heard many of these great things as well. But the crowd on, on Friday shouting, crucify him, these would have been more made up of, of some Jerusalem locals mixed with some scribes and priests. And, and Matthew s- says in his account that they were persuaded by Caiaphas, the high priest, to, to kind of be like a manipulated mob that, w- that would come and, 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 and help turn the tide when it came to Jesus. So while it is certainly true that some of the crowd would have become disillusioned between Sunday and Friday, the main vibe around Jesus would have, would have changed from, from shouts of praise to condemnation, condemnation for death because he wasn't who they wanted him to be. But by and large, it wasn't the same people. So I thought that was interesting. But back to Palm Sunday. Again, this was a huge deal. This king wasn't like any other king. In one sense, he was quite unique in that he was not known for his military might. He was not a king showing up with stories of the battles he had won and defeated other armies or anything like that. He was known for casting out demons, for healing the blind and performing miracles and feeding people. The crowd had seen him do these things and they followed him. He didn't come to Jerusalem on a white war horse with gold chariots or a choreographed military demonstrating his power and wealth. No. Jesus came with no soldiers, no gold chariots, not even a horse. He would come into Jerusalem on a young donkey. And in verse 15, we see John quoting Zechariah 9, 9 through 10. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. John quotes Zechariah here to make sure the reader sees this prophecy as being fulfilled. Just one of over 300 prophecies that Christ would fulfill in his life, but this was a big one. And it also tells us a lot about the type of king that is showing up. This is not your regular political ruler. Carter says that the choice of the donkey reveals that this king will achieve his victory through humility. The salvation he secures will come through meekness. He doesn't come to destroy other nations, but to proclaim peace to all the nations. The Jews expect the Messiah to liberate them, crushing the nations in the process. But the king comes to bring peace to all the nations. So in one sense, the reality is actually even worse for the Jews than, they knew, than what was actually going on. If you think about it, what do they want most? Someone to come wipe out Rome, right? They're sick of Rome. But not not only is he not coming to be the Jews' king and to crush the Romans and to 
to take their land back. And what is he actually coming to do for the Jews and the Romans? He's coming to be the savior of the Romans as well. Not from their political enemies either, but from the sin that binds them. So Jesus wasn't not only coming to, was he not coming to, to just defeat the Romans, he was, he was coming to be their savior, their only way to have freedom from their sin. Not just for the Jews, but for all people. And this is where, where they missed or maybe had a selective memory from all these Old Testament prophecies because God had always planned to be a God of all the nations. This wasn't some new idea on Palm Sunday. In Genesis 12, he tells Abraham that all the people on the earth will be blessed through him. Not just the Jewish, Jewish people. Not just the people like Abraham. But all the nations. And the one to bless them, the Savior, would come through the line of Abraham's family, a Jewish man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And that's who is riding this young donkey down the road to Jerusalem, riding a donkey to communicate he was coming in humility to bring peace. Verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. They couldn't stay quiet about this. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now they're getting irritated with each other because they can't seem to figure out how to stifle this situation. Verse 16 says that the disciples didn't really understand what was going on here. Look, they had been traveling with him for a while now, living humbly, humble lives alongside Jesus. They saw he had no place to lay his head. And here he was being praised by the crowds as king. And while the disciples were confused, the Pharisees were furious. Verse 17 and 18 says that the crowds kept talking about how Jesus raised Lazarus from the grave and they continued to bear witness about it. Over and over again, people can't stop talking about the impact that Christ's redeeming work had on Lazarus. I would love to see more of that today. People just overwhelmed by seeing death to life transformation in people. And it was causing more and more people to leave the influence of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and follow Jesus. As Steve put it, he said, the resurrection of Lazarus was the last straw for the, for the envious Jewish religious elite. Something had to be done. They had to take things in their own hands. They had to kill Lazarus, they had to kill Jesus because this was getting out of hand. And the popularity of Jesus was growing and it was really frustrating and really offensive to his enemies. Regardless, the king had arrived and he was there for all people, not just the Jews. It should be no surprise then that the next paragraph is about who wishing to see Jesus. John gets right to it. Verse 20 says that now among those who went to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip who was, with, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee and asked him, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Some Greeks here likely is referring to just Gentiles in general, not necessarily Grecian nationals, but it is intentional by John showing that this king truly was coming for all the nations. It's just a nod to where things are going to go, to make things right between us, not just Israel and God, but between all nations of the earth and God, that he had come to pay the penalty of our sin. And we're not, you know, 
Gentiles in Rome, but, but we're Gentiles on the other side of the planet, and so I ask you the same question. Have you heard what Christ has done, and do you wish to see him? Like these men going to Philip. Have you heard what Christ has done, and you wish to see him? Have you seen and believed? Have you felt compelled maybe to put down some of the things that you're carrying and get a firm hold on the keys of the gospel, on on Christ in your life? And if not, why not today? Holding all that stuff just gets exhausting. Setting it down and making sure you have have a grip on the gospel for your life um, is just incredibly freeing. And so if you have not done that, I invite you to do that today. We're, We're doing baptisms next week, as Steve mentioned. And we would be so thrilled to help you make that step, to publicly declare that Jesus is your king, that you have seen the things he has done and you believe in who he is and you want to follow him for the rest of your life. Declare him as your king. But Jesus wasn't just coming to Jerusalem as a king. He was also coming as a lamb. And I'll close with this. If you remember back to the beginning of this chapter, uh, what festival was taking place this week? Passover, right? Passover was the festival that, that the Jews had been celebrating and practicing for thousands of years, remembering how God, through Moses, instructed his people to put the blood of the lamb over their doorway so that when God came to punish Egypt, he would pass over the homes of of his people because they were marked by the blood. They were protected from the wrath of God by the blood of the lamb. And every house he passed over, and so year after year after year, they remembered this and they celebrated this. It was a reminder that the blood of the lamb protected them from the wrath of God. And, and, and year after year, ever since then, men from all over, every Jewish man would have to, to, to make this pilgrimage to Jerusalem and they would have to bring with them a lamb to, to be sacrificed in the place of their sin as an offering to pay for their sin. This would happen every year according to the law. And Hebrews talks about how this, this had to happen. And he says, indeed, under the law, most Every, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no for forgiveness of sin. So if these men didn't come every year with their lamb and shed this blood, their sins wouldn't be forgiven. So every year they did that. They, they would make the journey from wherever they were at. They would make the journey to Jerusalem with their lamb. And they would have to sacrifice the lamb to pay for their Sin. And we, we can learn from Josephus, the great Jewish historian, military leader from the first century. He wrote that, um, that the, a census was taken, and, and, and the estimation is that about 256,000 lambs would come to Jerusalem every year and be slain for the sins of all the people. That's a lot of lambs. Now picture this. 256,000 lambs. Picture this road full of people from all over the region coming because they had, they had sinned, because that's what we do. And according to the law, they had to bring this lamb to come and, 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 and sacrifice it for their sins. And so they're carrying these lambs or, or, or pulling these lambs up this hill to Jerusalem. And who is entering Jerusalem with them? Surrounded by the Lamb of God, was lambs everywhere to his left, to his right, to be seen. And he was coming to be the lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice to once and for all be the penalty, take the penalty for our sin. And I I don't know about you, but I could imagine bringing a lamb to Jerusalem from wherever you lived would have taken a lot of work. Probably would have been really hard. Probably would have been pretty sweaty, probably would have had some stubbornness in that lamb. And and to imagine the work it took to get a lamb from wherever you lived to Jerusalem feels a lot like probably how hard we can try to work to earn 
approval and forgiveness and love and mer- like from our Savior. So I can just, just, just imagine Jesus walking up the road and looking around, all these people trying to do it on their own, trying to have to bring this lamb on their own to the altar to be sacrificed, saying like, no more. Your works are like filthy rags. I have come so that you don't have to do this anymore. To be the perfect lamb to die in your place. And so if that's you and you find yourself just trying to work so hard to be enough so that God could find you lovable. I want you to know that you are lovable because of what Jesus has done. And God looks at you and your sin and and, in all of your past, present, and future and says your sin has been paid for and covered by the blood of Jesus. What a beautiful thing. And we get to celebrate that this week. A new king, a humble king, came to be the perfect sacrifice for our sin. Let's stand together.